Well, thank you once again. And uh, well, with this, we're moving to the very last session of the day. Last, but extremely, extremely exciting. Uh, that is Web3 and with consumer focus. Now for the session, we have Mr. Tarun Katyal, founder and CEO, eWorld Platform, as our moderator. Joining him, Mr. Himal, Ka Himal Kalra, Web3 investor and former strategist for Web3, uh, Bessemer Venture Partners India, Ms. Namrita Mahindru, Chief Digital Officer, Aditya Birla Chemicals, Mr. Rahul Mishra, Head Web 3.0 Initiatives, Shimaru, Mr. Sudeep Singh, Vice President and Head of CX Business, SAP, and Mr. Vishal Gondal, Founder and CEO, Gokwe Technologies. So, thank you everyone for uh, being here. We've got a really interesting panel, and I know it's the end of the day, but uh, you know, you're on to a new journey with Web3, so I hope we're going to keep you excited. And, and there are folks who have different kind of, uh, you know, perspectives uh, and paradigms around Web3. So we've got a great collection of people. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Uh, let me start with, you know, the lady on the panel, uh, Namrata. Brands are embracing Web3 very, very quickly, right? They're, they're doing this across different kinds of uh, aspects. So whether it is supply chain, whether it is entering the metaverse, whether it is building loyalty uh, programs, whether it's building digital assets, whether it's building a combination of digital and physical assets in the market. And we've seen people like Nike, Adidas at one end doing some you know incredible work. And then there are now automobile companies and others also you know, obviously Tesla and, and, and the coin story is separate, but some of the others also embracing digital, digital and digital assets really well. Talk to me about, you know, you as a chemical company, where people who think that this is completely untraditional or, or, you know, people would wonder what you're doing on the panel, but what you were telling me right before this was really, really interesting. So talk to us about what you guys are doing at Aditya Billa Chemicals and, you know, how do you really see Web3 emerge in an organization like yours? Thanks, Tarun. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me start by saying that uh, Aditya Birla Chemicals is actually um, a set of five different companies uh, which are all tied together with chemistry. And one of those companies happens to be a yarn company. Yeah. Now, when you look at the textile industry, it's actually a very long value chain. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history so that you can understand you know, where, does, where do we fit in when I'm talking about the yarn business. Uh, so you start with the forest. You have pulp and fiber, and Aditya Birla also has a presence in pulp and fiber. And then you have yarn, and then you get into the different kinds of fabrics, and then the brand retailer. That's the value chain. Now, um, a couple of years back, 2018 to be more specific, uh, we had the pulp and fiber business within the group, which started looking at uh, the whole sustainability space. Uh, one of the things that they were getting from the brand retailers was that uh, they wanted to make sure that what was being produced and sold as, you know, um, as yarn, which was, uh, or fiber, which was uh, natural, was actually so. So that meant going back all the way to the forest and figuring out that, you know, it was from uh, a particular forest and uh, it was uh, completely natural and could be lab tested again to make sure the genuineness uh, of the naturalness of the fiber. Uh, so they started with that. The second thing was, in the last two or three years, I think the demand from customers around you know, um, being more sustainable across brands, across categories, has increased substantially. So given that was the second lever which became extremely important, uh, you know, it was the brands and the customers together who started pushing uh, the envelope and saying, how do we know that what we are buying uh, is actually natural? Uh, we have a brand called Lever, uh, which is produced by the uh, pulp and fiber business. And this brand, uh, you know, was the brand which first started experimenting with the whole sustainability space. Now, when you're talking about being sustainable, being able to disclose across some 3,000 odd um, uh, partners in the ecosystem, that, and this is only up to the stage of the yarn, that you actually are producing natural fiber, you need a fairly robust infrastructure. And that's when you know, different solutions were evaluated and uh, blockchain came on the, uh, on the forefront. Uh, 
Uh, what we've done over the last three or four years is really then look at um, creating provenance at two levels. One, from the fiber um, and uh, the pulp business back to the forest. Uh, and the other one is all the way from the fiber business to the branded retail. Now, the way we do that is through a two-pronged approach. One, we use a, uh, a DNA uh, sampling in the fiber uh, so that even after post facto, after the you know, cloth has been uh, sent across and used in the branded retail space, if somebody has a question, they actually have a QR code which they can read and you know, they can, it can get, be sent back. If the brand retailer has a problem, it can be sent back to our labs and it can, it can be tested. The second one is down the value chain, which is around the whole invoicing, et cetera. Uh, and just making sure that, again, the QR code carries the fact all along the way, not just from an invoicing point of view, but also the genuineness of the, of the material uh, that we are using. Uh, when it's going to the gray fabric uh, producers, when it's going to you know, uh, other producers in that journey. So that's what we've done in a nutshell. Uh, the yarn business now, uh, which is what uh, is part of the chemical business, is looking at replicating that so that we can extend uh, the whole experience in the value chain and it's not stopped at the fiber stage. It's an incredible uh, example. I think, you know, uh, we've, I uh, recently passed out of my, uh, you know, digital transformation post-graduation at Kellogg and we did a lot of these examples on the book. But your one example that has been so beautifully implemented. So, you know, kudos to that. A lot of people think that a lot of this does not happen with good Indian companies. But here's an example of how blockchain is being, good, being put to good enterprise use, right? Uh, and blockchain is not always equal to crypto coins or, or, or all, the, all the issues that come around with people like FTX. So, you know, talking about FTX, right? Uh, and I'm not <laughs> queuing you into that, Himal. But... Uh, You've been seeing Web3 projects from, you know, an objective view across many, many sectors and categories. Here's a good example of blockchain being put to enterprise use, but you've also seen a lot of this happen on the consumer side, right? Talk to me about where do you think, uh, you know, we are going with Web3 adoption. Talk to me about which sectors you really think are going to uh, be the natural first. And, where, you know, gazing into about three to five years from now, where do you really think we are going to be with Web3? Um, so I think first of all, I think the easiest transition we're going to get for normal consumers to Web3 is going to be through gaming. For the sole reason, gamers are already quite nerdy. And not in a bad way, it's good. I'm a gamer, I like it too. And you know, so they're already on the computer, they have some basic knowledge. On top of that, they're doing a lot of microtransactions. And these microtransactions, they're just giving the company. They never see any of it back. But when it utilizes blockchain, if all the time spent, all the effort in the game, it can be commoditized. And then someone else who's coming new into the game, who doesn't want to spend 10,000 hours playing that game to acquire the relevant asset to flex to their friends, they can straight away buy that commodity from someone who's just put in the time. So I see that being one of the biggest waves to mass adoption for the basic consumers. So what you're really talking about is that making sure that you know, your effort, uh, your proof of work is rewarded at some point in time. And then, you know, that is tradable in, in, and value creating for you in some form or the other. Exactly. It's right? paying you for your hours. Correct. People spend their time playing, people get rewarded. Correct, correct. And, and you create so much of network effect with that, uh, which finally, you know, gives you some kind of monetization. Right. Let me pick that right up to the man in the red, right? Uh, I've never seen him wear anything but red shoes and red t-shirts. So, I don't know how many pairs he has in his cupboard or in his wardrobe. But, you know, Vishal, you are possibly one of the best examples of how people have created a marketplace around loyalty coins, loyalty points. And, and you're talking about now migrating that large piece of, of you know, action onto the chain. And, and I know, you know, even... Uh, spending time with you that you're very close to actually making that happen. So talk to you about why you're moving this to Web3. There's so many loyalty programs that have existed on Web2 for so many years. Continue to do that. Where do you find the need? How are you going to integrate, you know, Metaverse into that? And I know you have big plans and you guys announced that last week itself. So I think, you know, your roadmap seems to be one of the most robust ones in India. 
uh, considering you're in the, in, you know, in, in the health space, which can actually benefit people a lot. We would love to hear where you're going with all this, yeah. So thanks, uh, thanks, Tarun. So I think first of all, since this is the world of marketing, and, uh, I think people need to realize very soon that the party which was started with feeding people cookies is going to be over. And I'm saying it in both health and even the internet context. Apple shut down uh, traceability and we know what happened to Facebook. And uh, if Google won't do it, I think the regulators everywhere in the world are going to, you know, the privacy rules and guidelines which are coming in are going to be uh, very, very strict around the consumer. So I think uh, similarly in health, what is happening is as a consumer, COVID has changed health behavior. All of us now have digital certificates of vaccination. We all know what is SPO2 and suddenly medical data has become consumer data. And all of us during COVID had some device, everybody had something or the other to measure it themselves. So consumers for the first time are equipped with health data. And what Goki is really trying to do is reward people for doing three things. One is do healthy behavior. So whether it is running, eating healthy, walking, drinking water, etc. Second thing is health data sharing. If you have health data, you can share it with us and this can help you analyze and so on and so forth. And third thing is we then use this data to create personalized advice for you, curate personal products like what food you should buy, we have a health store. So we've already built the ecosystem to enable this. But Web3 changes the game for us because for the first time, I can now directly reward the customer with something which is fungible. So we started by creating our own loyalty point, which we call Goki Cash. So you could win go or earn Goki Cash by doing healthy behavior. But since this was a loyalty point, you could not convert that to cash. You could only use it in our store to get discounts or get deals and rewards. So it was a closed ecosystem within our ecosystem. But now, the minute we are able to take this to blockchain, what is gonna happen is your insurance company will say, hey, you know what? If you've earned these Goki coins, I'm willing to accept it as premium. Or your uh, diagnostic center, your doctor, your hospital, your health food, your gym. So suddenly it opens up possibility for us because it's fungible, the ecosystem or the network which we are going to build. So this is a perfect thing for preventative healthcare where you get rewarded for healthy behavior and then these rewards translate into things which you need to be healthy. So it creates the perfect. So actually healthcare, education are few industries uh, and community of course being a big one where uh, Web3 is going to be a perfect use case and that is why we are kind of working towards implementing it. Just one last part on the metaverse. I think metaverse is a, a trend where user interface is going to become 3D. I think with 5G, better devices and you know better processing on the cloud. Uh, we are all going to start seeing 3D applications and I think Metaverse is just the natural progression for user interface which is why we are implementing that. Yeah, and I think, you know, what you do with fungibles or non-fungibles will also get far more utility on the Metaverse, right? Exactly. So, our concept is that we need to find who really wants these tokens. So, the insurance company is one of our biggest partners because they want this you don't want McDonald's to even accept our token because we are not here trying to make you spend unless McDonald's uses some really healthy food. So even brands have a very interesting role here because brands can now embed them into communities with commerce by accepting the right kind of token. So if I am any D2C brand which is doing pe you know peanut butter and supplements and anything to do with health, you become our natural ally. And similarly, if you are any experience for health. So you could be running a, 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 a spa, a yoga studio. So everything around this ecosystem kind of plugs into this. You know, I'm really looking forward, you know, you could do a lot for just health as an ecosystem, forget everything else and making people healthy eventually because they have these coins and they, they really build, you know, more and more services through that. 
Talk to me a little bit about Himal, about fungibles and non fungible. I think the audience would want to understand the differences, where you see NFTs going, where do you see fungibles going, and you know, as an investor and, and people who are building theses, what would you think is the future of both and individually and together? Okay, so for those of you who don't understand fungible and non fungible, fungible would be like money. I can give you a 50 rupee note, you can give me 10, I mean 5, 10 rupee notes. That's fungible. Non fungible is something that cannot be, is not separate, is fully separate from any other thing of its kind. So, and is verified on the blockchain. So it cannot be duplicated in any way or form. So then in that sense, there are many tokens out there. But then there's NFTs as well. They have a lot, they can and are mostly of smaller mark, uh, sizes, collection sizes. So then they have a lot more uh, odd volume, you can say, because there aren't millions of tokens being created, traded like that. And it becomes in sort of a way like, if you think about real estate, you can go, you can want to sell your house, but someone has to want to buy exactly your house. There's no liquidity for it. So in NFTs, you have to find someone who wants your exact one. There's not exactly liquidity out there. So it's, very, it's a lot more, uh, what's the word for it? Just Unique, distinct. Uh, unique, distinct, but it's a lot slower to process yeah. because of that reason. Because it, someone has to point at that one and say, I want that exact one. There's not a market of hundreds of them at the same price or anything like that. Everything is completely unique. Yeah. So good. I think let me take that to you, Sudeep, right? Uh, you've heard uh, Namrita speak, you heard uh, Vishal speak, you heard Himal speak, right? And everybody is talking about different kind of use cases, but what comes out of Vishal and Himal is that we now are entering an era where we want to create mass adoption of Web3, right? And of the chain. And Namrata has got a beautiful B2B example, which in itself is very scaled up. But as we get to, you know, what Vishal's doing or what Himal's talking about in gaming, CX will become really, really important and critical, right? And I believe you at SAP are doing far more experiments as well as, you know, building a stream around and doing seamless CX around Web3. So talk to us a little bit about what are you guys thinking? Where do you want to take this? And, you know, how could it really benefit the Web3 revolution? Definitely. So, uh the examples we have seen of Web 3.0 had the advantage of starting from scratch on a clean slate. That's why you've seen the evolution of these business models, whether it's NFT trading or the application of NFTs and loyalty points there. So, so the organization is focused around one use case. Or in case of Namrata, where the, the use case was again a clean slate in terms of traceability, right? I think the real adoption of Web 3.0 will happen when, when we take this concept and apply it to each and every part of the organization. We at SAP are in the business of, uh, you know, binding the organizations together by being the heart and having the data at the core. So, uh, what steps we have taken? We've taken very baby steps in the sense that uh, the identity and consent part is what we are directly focusing on. But what we are indirectly focusing on is how do we enable, uh, you know, use cases which are new, which are like traceability is a classic example. The other one which comes to my mind is, for example, the warranty claims. Mm. Right. So when, when you buy something, it has a warranty, it has a bill, you are always searching for that bill, there's a dealer involved, right? You struggle to convince the OEM, no, this is a genuine dealer, I, I, this is what I thought was the right dealer to buy from, right? And those invoices are sometimes, uh, you know, handwritten or similar to handwritten, if, even what if they are printed, like right? In our, in our so, language. so that's one of the classic examples which, which comes as a use case. Again, we are in discussions with companies, but our job is more to enable their existing systems, existing processes, uh, make them agile enough for them to enable this for their customers. I think that is going to be the key in the adoption. And what we've seen is just, you know, scratching the service in, in terms of the use cases which have come up. I think once we are able to bridge this, the old world, which is web 1.0 or 2.0 to this web 3.0, I think then you will see the inflection point and the explosion happening. So I have a follow on from there, Sudeep. Uh, a lot of people want to do this. Yeah. Uh, talk to us a little bit about capability building, talent building, right? Because not a lot of people are able to implement and execute some of this until you have the right kind of requisite amount of talent. Uh, and where do you really, you know, what is the ideal talent for this? Where do you go find the talent? Are you guys helping people train talent because, you know, you, you're wanting people to do this at scale? Because even large companies today find it hard to 
to you know get talent that is adept with blockchain because everybody wants to do stuff on the cloud everybody is you know used to doing stuff in a more traditional way and inertia to change is, is very high so uh, i don't think there is non availability of talent uh, india i was reading uh, in fact today morning itself uh, is 11% of the world's web 3.0 talent is in india right now i think working the for the world working for everybody yeah. <laughs> unfortunately india not world, uh, <laughs> india has taken a leap forward there as well actually include dubai in india there is only 50% <laughs> actually if i can add something the whole blockchain developers are less than any of the fan com individual companies so it is so minuscule right now yeah there is absolutely exponential growth coming yeah. Yeah. so i think uh, the the challenge lies in how do you bring it together somebody take orchestrating it like in vishal's case he is orchestrating that model of you know loyalty or in their case they are orchestrating that process in a single point i think that is missing because organizations are still to in envision how they will use web 3.0 i think once there is a clear direction in how they can use i think then the talent will come on board and then that will lead to more talent getting trained on these technologies i think the gap is not in terms of the building blocks available but somebody putting them together and making a wall or a and building yeah, and people like you are Uh, um, we, are, we are helping the organ definitely correct. we are doing our bit but i think it's still very early phase uh, for yeah. this part of the innovation to happen mm. but definitely this is and does sap see this as as a area of growth definitely our our growth lies in making organizations agile to adopt these technologies for even if it's metaverse it's a channel for us to right. sell on right. right so if we are able to build that agility that will be the contribution you're, you're wanting to do the building yeah. blocks yeah that's yeah, right, yeah, right. Okay, let me come to Rahul. Rahul's been a veteran in the in the media space for many many years. I think I met him like several years ago. We worked for a little while together. And Rahul, you've been through many uh, content companies uh, in your career, and now doing Web three. How do you see this shift? What do you think uh, is so different about doing Web three in a content company? What are the kind of use cases you've identified, and where do you think this will be in the near term and long term? Sure. Thanks, Arun. Uh, <clears throat> I think the joke is. you know my boss showing me a report of metaverse being a 13 trillion dollar opportunity and he asking me where is our share in that uh, that's early on the year we looked at it and and <clears throat> as a media company you know shimaru has seen web 0 1 2 3 uh, we've been there we've been sort of seeing technology uh, coming and sort of making it more easy for consumers to access entertainment uh, and this trend of web3 is happening and you know it's happening really fast uh, people from media would know that the term audience for tv moved to consumers to ott and now it's communities as we go to web3 uh, and i think every media company has to embrace this now if you want to uh, you know continue to build in the entertainment space so we see two interesting applications of web3 uh, in the media space one is the entire uh, decentralization approach which is on the back of blockchain uh, that enables actually consumers to be now finally getting their due for the time they're spending on entertainment being part of the entertainment as well and being rewarded for the entire uh, engagement they are bringing to the platform that's one very interesting part we are building on uh, to me personally the second most important part is the immersive entertainment and you know as vishal was also talking about it uh you know we firmly believe that in i don't know when but in the next 2 to 2 to 3 years uh the way we interact on internet is going to change it's going to get more 3d more immersive when that happens are we equipped to entertain consumers the way they should be because you you're going to be in a different environment altogether uh it's going to be more volumetric you're going to have a lot more gaming companies have actually evolved a lot more in that entertainment as yet hasn't hasn't got there so we as a company want to be one of the early movers in this space and create those experiences in a way help web3 become more massy and consumer that's also the approach we are working towards vishal you are very like he spoke about metaverse you are very bullish on the metaverse right do you think the advent of 5g will change this uh, considerably yeah. so i think the one of the best things is people always underestimate the power of technology right i still remember when 4g was launching people said who will ever want to consume videos and you know there was a lot of skepticism on why do we need 4g but now we know that it is 4g which has propelled the ott and the youtube and the entire video business and ott business was built on the back of 4g 5g is going to do the same for 
3D immersive experiences, basically. Because with 5G, with, you know, 5, 6, 700 Mbps, and hopefully with better screens, now you already know foldable phones have come in, better form factor, cheaper form factor. So with the 5G speeds, you are not going to see more video. Video already you are seeing. I mean, maybe, yeah, you, you can... You don't need 5G for video, right? Maybe 4G you will see that. all 4K videos, but on such a small screen, seeing a 4K video makes no sense. But what makes sense is now having live 3D experiences, doing what in the gaming world, what we say massively online multiplayer. So gaming had this term called MMORPG, massively online multiplayer role playing games, which required latency very, you know, and you know, these kids were you know, on these computers with very, very fast connections, trying to make sure there is not even one microsecond of latency, because if I am playing uh, Counter-Strike, if I shoot the guy, it cannot reach later or I'll get shot. Now, all that is going to go away with 5G. It's going to be very fast. And what also happens is, you may have already seen, Facebook has bet on, on the metaverse. But what actually is happening, just to kind of explain you, is it is the change of the user interface. Firstly, creating a profile picture itself was a big thing. Kya re, profile picture dekho. Now, people are going to start creating their 3D avatars as profile pictures. So that is going to be the transition of you to the 3D avatar. And now if you must have seen all these AI based uh, photographs and you know, which is creating, imagine if you could suddenly create your 3D avatar, which looks like one of the superheroes, which you would like to put. And then your 3D avatar will go into a world of shopping uh, or it could go in a community. So I think it is the perfect, I think, all the various parameters to build this is already happening. And I think the only one last point I want to kind of add over here is that gaming always leads uh, all technology. I mean, there's one other industry of porn, which we can't talk about, but uh, you know, gaming leads a lot of this technology adoption. So what is happening now is gaming may already, Fortnite already had millions of people see a live concert uh, three years back already. So it's not a big deal to host a concert in the metaverse. It is not a big deal for people doing conversations, chatting and uh, you know, living in the metaverse. So it's already happened in the gaming world. It is just that now this is coming to mass consumers. And mass adoption, right? So Rahul, you spoke about that people can now participate and, and can be a part of, uh, you know, the content consumption and get rewarded. And, and I can tell you what we are doing at Koto, which is a social community platform for women, is that our one track is fully about participative ownership and we built our entire referral program on the chain. So talk to me about what you're really thinking with Shimaru on, you know, on building participative ownership. I'm going, okay, as, I don't know if it's on record or not, but the ideal wish list, okay, if we have to live in the true sense of decentralization, uh, Shimaru should not be an IP holder of 4,000 Bollywood films, right? Uh, we should be actually making consumers part of this entire storytelling experience. So, so the easiest first step we're going to take is on the NFT track. How do we actually give access to uh, consumers part of a content uh, currently, there are not enough monetization opportunities for consumers to uh, buy the NFT and actually make money out of it. As that tracks get developed with DRM globally getting a standard for Web3 in place, we're looking at those opportunities. Uh, and I think on the whole, the entire storytelling experience should start with the community giving you, a, uh, you know, an initial feedback to either building it themselves or we co-creating and building it with them. I think that's the ideology. So in the next five to seven years, it's going to be co-created. Eventually, the community might actually create those experiences. Yeah, I think participative ownership in tokenomics is, is the key to actually making decentralization happen. I think with that, I'm being told that the time is up and we can take a, possibly a couple of questions before we, we wind this up. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you just ask us? It's okay. We can hear you. So, you know, and I can give you my example, but Himal, you can also go ahead. Uh, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say that. I've invested in a company which is like, uh, they're called Snickerdoodle. What they do is they're like cookies for Web3. 
they tokenize every transaction, everything of a wallet that is ever done, and give NFTs in place back to the users, and the users can then choose it to sell it to advertisers. And there are a few others like this as well, but that seems to be around. The Correct. So on our platform, it's a social community platform. We have given decentralized controls to every single community owner to choose whether they want advertising or what kind of advertising will they allow on, on their community. So it's really about giving back and that advertising is all consumed through tokens. So if I'm a community owner, then I can choose to get tokens for advertising on my community and that, you know, leads to data sharing or not, right? So the power is going back to the individuals and to the community owners for that, yeah. Understood, yeah, perfect. Anybody else? No? Okay. Thank you so much, folks. We are right on time. Uh, and you were a great audience. You know, you guys kept up to a lot of the rambling that we did. <laughs> so, have a great evening. And uh, thank you, everybody on the panel for, uh, you know, talking to us about stuff that is possibly, you know, going to evolve. And, and uh, we are, like, kind of confusing everybody around in this room. But maybe years down the line when we're here, we would have told you that we told you that then. And we're not doing that at all. So, <laughs> this is going to be an evolving space and, and let's keep watching it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tarun. Uh, with that, we definitely wind up uh, the whole track B, Technology for Marketing. That's it for Marketing in Technology for this year. Uh, please stay tuned with IMAI for further events, what we are doing. A lot of conferences, which is India Digital Summit happening in... 21st, 20, 20th and 21st February, and Intersec, which is our residential event for marketeers and, and agencies. Thank you so much. 